he gets there. The alternative media, Jerry. That's where you hear the truth. You're listening to Media Monarchy with James Evan Pilato. The terribly familiar theme of the corporatization of rock culture lies at the heart of Christopher Wilch's The Target Shoots First, his personal video diary of a post-collegiate stint in the marketing department of mail-order music outfit Columbia House. The film captures the precise period of both rock and filmmaking in 1993 when Nirvana helped create a new niche on which the corporate suits at first couldn't put a label and amateurs armed with Hi8 cameras began to produce autobiographical works typically adorned with the sound of their own voices. Opening footage in the film The Target Shoots First, which was released in the year 2000. Opening footage in the film shows Wilch's last gig with his band and serves as a reminder of where he came from. Though we have to accept on faith his claim in the film that he's a major record collector. He never films his home entertainment lifestyle. He just films his workplace. His alleged record listening habits prove crucial down the road as the philosophy major reluctantly job hunts and lands a position at Columbia House's assistant product manager. Expecting to be more a gopher than anything else, Chris Wilcha is thrust into greater and greater responsibility perceived in this somewhat loose but still conservative corporate environment as its youth connection to the burgeoning alt music scene. This is my band's final show. It's May 1993. I'm 22 years old and I've just graduated from college. I live in New York City and the lease on my apartment is about to expire. I need a job. I apply for an opening at Columbia House, the oldest and largest mail-order CD and tape club in America. I'm fully prepared to explain how mowing lawns and managing a record store in high school are perfect qualifications for an entry-level position in the marketing department. But instead of talking about my inexperience, the main topic of the interview is the alternative rock band Nirvana. Their major label debut, Nevermind, has sold 4 million copies since its release in the fall of 1991 and is still at the top of the Billboard music charts. As a longtime fan of the band, I have no problem explaining their breakthrough success to my 40-something interviewer. To my total surprise, I was not only taken seriously, I was offered the job. As a graduation gift, my parents give me a Sony Hi8 video camera. I decide to bring it to work with me every day. New employee orientation is at 8.45 a.m. on Monday morning. I'm so nervous, I almost forget which building the company is in. Before I'm officially employed, I have to fill out a stack of paperwork that anticipates every possible life experience I might have. In orientation, I learn that Columbia House is co-owned by Sony and Time Warner, two of the six multinational corporations that dominate the music industry. Sony is also the world's largest consumer electronics firm, manufacturing CD players and video cameras. Combined revenue of the two parent companies is close to $70 billion. The personnel director explains that the benefit of corporate monopolies like these is that as a Columbia House employee, I'll have access to both the Sony and Time Warner cafeterias. The target shoots first, maintains the casually spontaneous structure of a diary where the mundane intersects with the metaphysical. 
a repeated motif, for instance, of an off-kilter shot from his office window of a skyscraper takes on almost mystical proportions. Wiltshire displays genuine curiosity about everything while maintaining a generationally correct, cynical irony. Thus, his camera takes in a host of office personalities letting their hair down. Two underlings admit they're upset by having to report to someone much younger than them, being Chris Wiltshire. Documents the basics of employee applications, training policy, pseudo-peppy motivation sessions, indulges in kooky insert shots when Wilch is feeling cabin fever in his office, and most interestingly, tracks the internal company clashes between the execs up on the 19th floor and the creative staffers down on the 17th floor. But there's more than just a stairwell that separates the two floors. The relationship between marketing and creative services is defined by power. Oh, uh, the official policy is that marketing is the client and we are the agency, and we have a client-agency relationship. That's the, that's the official company line. And you think that's not true, or you think... I'm not sure it works well within the structure of a single corporation, because, um, of course, clients and agencies are normally two different companies. All of the work done by the 50-person creative staff on 17 must be sent upstairs to be reviewed and approved by our three-person marketing staff on 19. This makes for a volatile relationship between the two departments. Convincing people from marketing that our opinions are valid, I've given up. I gave up long ago. Within the company, what floor you work on is like a shorthand for your identity. I think the... The 19th floor is the executive floor, even though there are some executives on 17. Mm -hmm. But the chairman, CEO, and CFO are on the 19th floor. I'm down on the 17th floor. I feel like I have a brain. I feel like sometimes I do stuff, but I'm kind of a service. I'm not really supposed to be a thinking person. I kind of feel like I'm sort of like an idiot savant with a magic marker, to be honest. The target shoots first begins to take on a kind of storyline as... Filmmaker Chris Wiltshire finds himself promoted to product manager, nearly succumbing to the unexpected pressure and long hours until he finds relief as he and an assistant reorganize the staff to produce an alternative catalog. Firmly believing it's subverting Columbia House, Wiltshire's group, in a stroke of truly blind naivety, eventually realizes that it's only created a new, easily labeled marketing niche. Incredibly, few people seem to bat an eye at Chris's camera, which is always on, which allowed Wiltshire to capture the weird tension between the freewheeling creative department and the responsibility-burdened marketing team. The old guard music executives and the younger employees versed in the nascent alternative music culture and a corporate environment not quite sure what to do with the next generation. I'm staying at the office later and later. I don't think Rick really knows how much work I'm doing because he keeps volunteering me for other projects. After Nirvana's highly anticipated album In Utero is released, the company decides that a big Nirvana feature will appear in the next club catalog. When the head writer on 17 unexpectedly quits, Rick tells Creative Services that I can write the copy. I mean, help me out here. This is a Generation X band you can speak for. (laughs) Um... When I sit down to write the feature, I'm confronted with how my identity as a punk rock fan and my job as a Columbia House employee have finally collided. From interviews I've been reading, Nirvana seem as conflicted about their mainstream success as I'm starting to feel about this job. I try to work this into the copy in some way. The world's been waiting to see what happens when teen spirit is reborn as adult rage, is my slightly overwrought opening line. The rest of the writing describes the songs, but in the final sentence I ask, are you still alternative when your last album sells over four million copies? In Utero answers that question with a resounding punk rock yes. I realize after this copy has been sent off to the printer that there's no such thing as a punk rock yes. Punk rock has always been about saying no to exactly the kinds of commercial systems that exploit bands like corporate record clubs. When I finally see a printed copy of this layout, the words punk rock have mysteriously disappeared. Filmmaker Chris Welch captured what it was like working at Columbia House during the boom time of the great CD ripoff of the early 90s. 
which is just one of the entertainment industrial complex subtexts in this low-key first-person documentary. Wiltshire, who started off in the marketing department as an assistant product manager and was soon promoted to product manager, takes a camcorder to work and captured the absurdity and mundanity of the company at that moment in time. He filmed scenes not just in the company's New York offices, but also at the massive Terre Haute, Indiana Manufacturing Customer Service and Distribution Center, which employed 3,300 people in 1996, as well as an amusing Aerosmith in-store appearance and a trade show rendezvous with David Hasselhoff. I felt this initial sense of elation when the letters arrived. We provided the company with a shortcut into the wallets of a notoriously skeptical demographic group. It occurs to me now that this was a somewhat dubious achievement, or maybe those consumers weren't so savvy at all. I thought that by infusing the magazine with the spirit of punk rock, even if it didn't include any of the actual music, was somehow a subversive act. But after hearing Rick read the ninth or tenth effusive letter, what we succeeded at was clear. We not only convinced the kids that consuming was cool, we made it seem like an act of defiance. The suicide of Kurt Cobain, who, like filmmaker Chris Wiltshire, was openly conflicted about creative needs and commercial pressures, seems to inspire our hero to quit. An amusing coda in which, after signing all the rights away to everything they made while he was resigning, Wiltshire finds a stylized use of his mug, his face, in the company's catalog a year later. But this documentary, released in 2000, leaves out the even more paradoxical fact that Wiltshire rejoined Columbia House again in 1999. Now today, in the present, Wiltshire co-directed Knock Knock It's Tig Notaro and directed and co-executive produced Showtime's version of This American Life. He now calls his creation, The Target Shoots First, a weird pre-internet document of that moment in time like The Office Before The Office which is a pretty good assessment. If anything, it's an unselfconscious and often quaint look at a time just before technology revolutionized both office culture and the music industry. A lot of people found out about this film, The Target Shoots First, on the AV Club's 2015 article, Four Columbia House Insiders Explain the Shady Math Behind Eight CDs for a Penny. But I I, I distinctly recall reading about this during its release. And of course, reading about things in the late 90s and the early 2000s, you could read about a lot of things. It didn't necessarily mean you were able to see it. I was still about an hour away from D.C., and by that point I was going into D.C. to watch films. But this kind of thing was only playing at film festivals, East Coast, West Coast. So I probably found out about it maybe reading the Washington Post, like I regularly did back then or in some other kind of East Coast media publication. Hell, I maybe even read about it in Spin. But I forgot about it. Then, probably five years later, Cassie tells me, hey, I saw this movie on IFC about this guy who works at Columbia House. I was like, oh my God, I've always wanted to see that. She got to see it when she first moved here to Portland back in January of 2005 on IFC. Like, man, I've always wanted to see that. And now you can. Chris Wilcha uploaded the entire film, The Target Shoots First, to Vimeo in 2013, which is when I finally saw it. I think it's a really great film. I highly recommend it. It's totally 90s, full of World Trade Center shots, and like any good album, it's over before you know it. The Target Shoots First, highly recommended film for you to watch, and that's our May segment of Deep Focus, my friends. You're listening to The Morning Monarchy for Friday, May 12th, 2017. I am James Evan Pilato from MediaMonarchy.com. You're listening to Media Monarchy with James Evan Pilato. Since 2005, Media Monarchy has covered the real news about politics, health, technology, and the occult, all remixed with music and media that matters. Go to MediaMonarchy.com support and become a monthly subscriber so you can help keep independent, non-commercial, alternative media going and growing. Thanks.